Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Saba Kassa. I'm a senior public governance specialist at the Basel Institute on Governance, and I'm pleased to be with you today to moderate, moderate today's event on using social norm and behavior change approaches to address corruption and tackle illegal wildlife trade. Uh, we look forward to a very lively discussion with you, so please therefore leave all your comments and questions in the, in the Q&A function that you'll find on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. So in today's webinar, we'll hear from Claudia Baez Gamargo, Head of Public Governance at the Basel Institute on Governance, and Gail Burgess, Behavior Change Program Leader at Traffic, about their recently published research on the evidence and potential application of social norms and behavior change approaches to address corruption and tackle illegal wildlife trade. Following their inputs, we'll hear reflections from our discussions, Gabri Vain, Director of Policy at Traffic, and Robert Lubulobi, independent consultant and anti-corruption expert joining us from Uganda. Without further ado, let me give the floor to you, Claudia, to share the findings from the problem analysis and state of the field review on the behavioral drivers, corruption facilitating the illegal wildlife. Oh, sorry. Okay, so, <laughs> so happy to be here with you and, uh, and to mark this occasion where we are launching our new working paper. And here I could not resist the temptation to share with you what it looks like because it's such a beautifully designed um, paper um, that Gail and I have co-authored and really happy to have this collaboration between Basel Institute and Traffic uh, take shape in this way. So basically what we've done, um, we have undertaken this study and I'll give you a, a little bit of background why, why we are focusing on this topic and why this study came about. So we all know that corruption is, uh, is, 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 is one of those um, um, key factors that enables environmental crime. We also know that corruption is resilient and it's difficult to eradicate. So as of recently, um, there's increasing evidence that shows how so-called behavioral drivers, so things like having to do with social norms or certain uh, um, um, preconceptions or stereotypes, um, incentivize and perpetuate patterns of corrupt behaviors. So this um, insight has um, increase the interest on, okay, so, so how can we develop anti-corruption interventions that target um, social norms and that promote behavior change? So so-called social norm and behavior change interventions. Um, and so, so there's a lot of interest, but there, there, there's uh, also, I would say, a lack of uh, clear guidance on how to apply this type of approach to the field of anti-corruption. Um, we know that SMBC approaches hold a great deal of promise, but they are not a silver bullet. They, they are not the key to get rid of corruption in and of themselves, and they may not always be fit for, for, for purpose. We need to know when uh, an SMBC approach is, um, is, is granted and is likely to be effective. So our working paper is one of the, those steps uh, towards developing in-depth guidance for practitioners that TNRC is, is actively promoting. So, um, just a little bit about what we did. Um, our aim was to uh, review what is the evidence out there on how these so-called behavioral drivers uh, of corruption uh, spur or facilitate illegal wildlife trade and to understand what works and what doesn't in fighting this kind of corruption, um, and also to identify entry points for designing interventions that can effectively reduce IWG-related corruption. So to do that, we did a very extensive literature review. So we looked at over 100 documents. Uh, we also looked at what 35 stakeholders and initiatives have been doing, what kind of approaches and with what kind of results they have implemented. And we also conducted uh, in-depth key expert interviews. Um, so I think that one of the main um, insights coming out of this exercise is that the, the, the space, the opportunity space where corruption can happen across the IWT um, chain is huge. So in, in the gray 
um, box uh, at the top, we just listed a, a indicative number of stakeholders that in principle can be engaging or can be vulnerable to corruption risks uh, from illegal wildlife trafficking uh, rings. And the types of corruption can be varied. So, so we can talk about bribery, patronage, state capture, extortion, and also what is the corruption aiming at. It can, corruption can be functional and can be instrumental to a great many things, to allow access to wildlife, for example, um, to leak intelligence about monitoring and patrols, to miss the clear species, to turn a blind eye on, on, on monitoring and inspections, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so basically what we're talking about is, is a very broad um, area where corruption risks can emerge involving a, a, a large number of stakeholders. Um, so one of the first things to understand then to make this practitioner relevant is that we, we need to try to do a rigorous diagnosis as to what are the types of corruption that matter here. So what are the concrete instances, practices, risks? What are the behaviors that are relevant to, um, to enable IWT and that are concrete enough that we can actually sit down and design interventions to tackle them. So this is really a call to move away from generalizing and assuming corruption risks, but rather we need to identify what are concrete typologies, what are concrete patterns that are associated to the illegal trafficking of wildlife goods in specific um, regions, in specific contexts. Um, the second step to make this uh, actionable is to understand what are the drivers behind the identified corruption practices. So, so basically what this means is what are those elements that are incentivizing or generate the corruption risks and, 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 and the corruption behaviors, ultimately. And in, in, in our field, we normally um, make a distinction between four different categories of drivers of corruption. Um, so one is a principal agent idea, meaning that corruption arises because of a problem in a principal agent relationship. So this has to do with things like lack of monitoring, lack of um, uh, uh, strict enough criminalization, enforcement of the rules, and so on. So, so these are law enforcement, but also um, monitoring based approaches. But corruption can also arise out of collective action problems. So if everybody is believing everybody else is corrupt, then the logical or even the rational solution is to engage in corruption as well, so as not to be on the losing side. Um, the third one is functionality of corruption. What this means is that corruption often is very useful to solve specific problems. Uh, so unless we understand what is the problem that is lying underneath uh, a, a particular corrupt behavior is difficult to deal with. A typical example, um, for example, corruption that happens in the provision of public services typically arises because there's a, you know, uh, too much demand for scarce services. So just a few health workers that have to look after a large number of patients. And then corruption becomes the way to jump the queue and to solve the problem at hand that I need to see a doctor, but I don't want to stand in line for a really long time. And then the behavioral drivers are what I was mentioning before, things to do with social norms, when corruption is socially accepted and expected, or also things like mental models, like stereotypes. Uh, if we believe that all law enforcement officials are corrupt, we're going to beha behave in a manner different than if we believe the opposite. So, we need to understand what kind of driver is at play in any, part, in any particular um, problem uh, of corruption. Uh, of course, a complicating factor is that often the different types of drivers may be intertwined in particular contexts. Um, so in this graphic, what I want to show you is that in what we've learned about 
how IWT happens, corruption takes place often because it is instrumental. It helps, you know, for the trafficking chain to function um, uh, more effectively. So it's about things like avoiding detection, um, expediting shipments, falsifying permits, but also, you know, for, for some of the people on the ground who are involved in the trafficking, it's also about making ends meet. So if there is not a uh, solution to the own livelihood that is available, but there is an offer to participate in this kind of trafficking, uh, then the, this, this um, you know, a, a, a low level public official might be more prone to receive a bribe um, because of this um, making ends meet kind of consideration. Um, and this functionality, the, 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 these instrumental considerations often take place in contexts where there are other drivers at place already. So not surprisingly, some of the countries that are hubs for the illegal trafficking of wildlife also have weak governance issues. So laws that are not adequately implemented or even the legal frameworks might be inadequate themselves. Um, corru uh, corruption as a collective action problem, where if everybody believes that corruption is endemic, nobody has really an incentive to stop, uh, as well as behavioral drivers, where social norms such as those of reciprocity, gift giving, obligation to the group, um, come into play into incentivizing and then locking in behaviors um, that, 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 um, that make the accept acceptability of corruption. Um. So, so, so basically then uh, the question is, we, we, we need to understand what are the drivers and what are, what are those elements in the context that are giving rise to the corrupt um, behaviors. Um, once we, we do this, and, and, and one of the next things that we did in the problem analysis was, was to understand, okay, so what do we know about um, the, um, what has been tried to tackle the corruption that incentivizes IWT, and what is the relative effectiveness of, of the different types of approaches? And one of the key findings um, is that really there are not that many um, anti-corruption, anti-IWT interventions. So most of the interventions that are um, tackling illegal wildlife trafficking have, uh, have, have not any uh, considerations linked to corruption and therefore also um, not taking into account the social uh, norms and behavioral aspects of the, of the corruption that we're interested in. Um, so in terms of what conclusions or what were the emerging insights that came overall from the, from the study, uh, one is that we need more nuanced and precise evidence on why, where and how exactly corruption arises uh, in the form of regularized patterns of behaviors that fuel IWT. So we know and we suspect that co corruption risks are there and that corruption materializes, but to make the, you know, to, 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 to make the considerations, to actually design interventions to tackle uh, these problems, we need to also be very clear about what these pro problems look like. So, so we need to talk about, you know, are we talking about bribery among specific public officials and the traffickers? in which country, at what, what level. We need to go to this level of granularity uh, to understand what it is that we're up against too, and, there, and therefore what, uh, what we can do about it. Um, a second consideration was that um, there is not a lot of evidence as to what works. And this is not for lack of programs that have tackled uh, IWT uh, and, have, uh, and have tried to deal with the corruption around it, but it's more about lack of monitoring and evaluation or a lack of good impact evaluation mechanisms to understand, okay, if we have taken this approach, to what extent have we achieved our goals of decreasing corruption, of decreasing illegal wildlife flows? So, so there is a, a need 
and, and this is, I suppose, a call for the practitioners to really take seriously the issue of, um, of monitoring and evaluation of their own initiatives, because we need to construct an evidence base. And so before we can make an assessment of what works and what doesn't, we need to, evidence to build the evidence um, based on concrete experiences of many of the ongoing programs that are out there working in this field. Um, the final thing we did in this paper was to come up with a framework to identify um, intervention entry points. And um, this is based on considerations of impact and feasibility. And I'll speak about that in a second. What does this mean? across the four key areas of the IWT chain. So these are the source, the end markets, the trafficking, and cross-cutting the policy, which encompasses law enforcement prevention uh, and pre prevention and cuts across the other three. So in terms of prioritizing, we suggest that it's important to prioritize in terms of impact. So this means for each context, there is always a plethora of corruption challenges that one could invest in addressing. Uh, the question is, where should we be spending our energies and our resources that will yield the greatest impact, that will create the biggest change in the direction that we want to see? So impact refers precisely to this. And, 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 and the call is to, you know, it is worth it investing in, 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 in making detailed assessments to understand what are the different um, problems of, of, of IWT related corruption and what is the relative impact to um, assess where it is worthwhile to spend um, resources in developing and testing interventions. And the second consideration is feasibility. And this is, you know, recognizing pragmatically that there are some problems of corruption and there uh, and there are some areas where it's you know it's going to require long-term sustained effort to achieve results whether there might be other instances where there might be low-hanging fruit that can be targeted so it is a call for practitioners to you know to to, to put these things uh, in, in in a balance and to, um, to, to make the, their programming decisions with consideration that is, am I going to have an impact enough? And is the problem that I'm trying to address feasible enough that I can re, you know, um, uh, achieve the, the, the goals of my uh, program or of my activities as um, intended? And then finally, this is what the net what the framework looks like. And like I said, it's it's looking at the these four key areas in the IWT chain: the source, that's where the poaching, of course, that's where the animals are, the trafficking, the transport, how the goods get, get from the source to the end markets, the end markets where the consumption happens, and then the policy. And here, basically, the idea is in each stage to have a look at who are the actors that are involved and what are the problems of corruption that we know of might be happening in this area and what might be the drivers. So very quickly, um, if we look at the source side of things, uh, what we know is that very often need is, a, is, is an important driver uh, where um, questions about subsistence might incentivize or, 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 or make people vulnerable uh, to, to giving in to corruption. And these, these risks are often, um, um, you know, accompanied by social norms and understandings that reinforce and make this behavior acceptable. So in this case, one would say, Yes, it might be important to ad adopt a social norm or behavior change approach, but it will not be enough unless we look at the root cause that has to do with subsistence. So making this kind of consideration can help us frame an intervention that is looking at, at alternative livelihoods, for example, but incorporating a social norm uh, approach as a complement to reinforce the outcome that we want to achieve. So 
this is a taste of what's the, the, the logic behind this framework um, uh, is, um, but I'm going to leave it here because I know that Gail is going to um, elaborate a, a little bit more in detail on what it means to apply this framework. So this is my segue to say over to Gail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Um, great to have um, everything, the huge body of evidence that's in the um, problem analysis uh, so succinctly. Hopefully everybody can see my slides. Um, okay, so I'm going to give um, some illustration of how the framework can be applied um, to combat illegal wildlife trade uh, related corruption. And I have 10 slides or so, um, so I'm going to try and do this in 10 minutes uh, to enable us to hear from our discussants and to have a good discussion around the topic from our audience. Um, I'm going to structure the slides by looking at each um, three of the four stages the framework uh, covers. Um, so starting with corruption at source, um, where the framework identified actors as poachers, rangers and local communities, and thinking about some of the drivers such as poverty, social norms and mental models. Um, Recognising that uh, the analysis identified low to medium potential for social norm and behaviour change uh, initiatives to make a significant contribution to combating uh, corruption at this stage. I'm um, going to discuss some examples that um, Traffic has identified through research conducted with 73 um, wildlife trade offenders um, that were convicted and placed in 25 institutions in South Africa. Um, we conducted this research in uh, 2020, 2019, 2020, and produced a couple of reports that um, the links to which are in uh, the graphic uh, at the bottom of the screen there. Um, so the, although most people think of um, kind of uh, pums and pangolins, uh, potentially also big cats when they think of um, South Africa and, and poaching issues, um, actually our, our uh, engagement in these wildlife trade offender interviews, um, you know, revealed and really reinforced for us the huge volume of different species impacted by um, illegal trade in wildlife in, in countries such as this. Um, so a really good example is the abalone trade. Um, over 96 million abalone have been extracted in the decade 2006 to 2016 which has led to a 35% drop in the population of um, wild uh, abalone available on the shores of South Africa. This is a marine mollusk for those that don't know. Um, cycads as well. Um, a lot of people uh, in South Africa, this supplies a uh, largely domestic market in, in South Africa. Um, cycads, one of the most threatened um, group of flora in particular um, in the world. 12 are listed as critically endangered and three are extinct in the wild. Um, and there are 38 species that are endemic to South Africa. They're indigenous to that country. And it seemed very much as a, a status uh, symbol to have one. Um, so they, they largely supply a domestic market, unlike abalone and rhino, which are, are largely for export overseas, in particular Eastern and Southeast Asian markets. So um, corrupt practices um, at source in particular involve um, bribes in order to get access to um, populations of these protected species of fauna and flora. And um, all of the uh, commodities that are required from those are high value. So in particular, in the context of um, uh, situations of, of high poverty in rural communities, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of uh, drive there to, to engage in these forms of illegal corruption. And 41% of those that were interviewed through this study actually reported corruption as one of the key enablers for getting them into illegal wildlife trade in the first place. It was quite high uh, proportion. Um, the issue is really complex. I, I drew out this quote in the bottom of the screen on the left um, to illustrate how actually uh, issues such as state capture also are, are sometimes evident um, or alleged to be, uh, as, as demonstrated through this uh, comment from interviewee 60, um, who commented that the abalone is exported to Asia and Asian nationals by the, the legal um, abalone, but also the illegal um, species too, um, claimed from when uh, material that's confiscated is, is resold on. 
Um, so it's a, a very kind of complex set of issues, which really illustrates the type of um, scenarios we were uncovering when we went through the um, literature review at the early stage of, of the um, problem analysis. So how, how do we tackle this? Um, so some simple uh, entry points identified by looking at tools that can both um, help to uh, penalise corruption where it occurs and, and prevent it from happening um, through punitive measures, thinking about controls in particular, and also considering um, the elements that might be directed a bit more towards persuasive tactics. So in simple language, carrots and sticks, and thinking as well about um, the levels, the rows really kind of try to distinguish between initiatives that would target individuals um, and think about um, uh, personal changes in, in behaviour, uh, but then also the social norms um, side of it that uh, Claudia really touched upon through her slides, thinking about the tolerance towards corruption and how that facilitates uh, continued engagement in corrupt acts. Um, some, some examples here, none of these uh, relate to this specific um, set of findings that we had in, in South Africa, as uh, Claudia has kind of introduced already, it's just quite hard to come up with um, exact examples already. Um, so on the top left um, box there, this relates to the guerrilla organisations work to um, prevent poaching from occurring in areas where um, there's already high prevalence of um, poaching occurring. And this initiative in particular relates to uh, mounting guerrilla protection. It was set up as a legacy initiative from Dr. Diane Fossey's work, for those that have heard of her. And um, these participants uh, are given exchange for ending in their illegal snares, their machetes and their rifles. Um, and if they take an oath to say that they're not going to engage in corruption anymore, um, they will uh, basically be uh, given a small portion of land so that they can engage in uh, organic farming, tree planting, um, beekeeping initiatives. Um, and this has been hugely successful in um, getting people out of poverty whilst also reducing the incidences of poaching um, where the mountain gorillas live. Um, initiatives that kind of transcend both self and society um, include things like a pedal powered community cinema and additional broader media outreach at the society level, so transit to the, the bottom right of the screen, um, where groups like Population Media Centre are already delivering um, quite exciting initiatives that build on what's called um, education entertainment. And these kind of try to address um, very complicated social and um, uh, conservation issues through adapting storylines using existing storylines typically um, that are already popular in, in different societies and cultures that um, we're trying to engage in discussion around these issues. Um, and, and kind of adapting the storyline so that a hero character um, is in, shown to kind of go through the transition towards the desired behaviour. And um, Population Media Centre did actually deliver an initiative focused on protection of mountain gorillas alongside um, population uh, lifestyle issues. And uh, it was found at the end of that 312 um, kind of series of uh, um, editions that were broadcast between 2006 and nine, I believe, the first time, and then they were rebroadcast later. Um, uh, listeners were 3.4 times more likely to um, say they supported the protection of gorillas and their habitat and recognise that it can reduce poverty and bring tourists um, to local areas. So the, the persuasive tactics, going back to the self, um, there's a few of these kind of reformed poachers um, initiatives springing up in different parts of Africa in particular at the moment. Um, they could appear elsewhere. Um, the gentleman showing on the graphic on the top right is Luca Chinoa, and uh, he was a poacher when at 25 years old, he became the principal breadwinner from, for his family um, when his father, who had been in the army, was killed and he was left to find ways to fend for himself and his family. So quite a classic illustration, a tragic illustration of how people are forced into this reality. Um, he would regularly go into the bush, he would get $15 for poaching a buffalo, he, he targeted buffalo, um, but it carried a lot of risks, it was very intermittent income for him, it was very dangerous, apparently black mamba are very prevalent in the areas in Zambia where he was going into, 
And so when he was finally um, caught and facing a custodial sentence for engaging in um, illegal poaching, um, Game Rangers International approached him and asked him if he would be interested to retrain with them as a reformed poacher and uh, become kind of a, a warden for elephants in particular. Um, so 12 years on after this exchange, he's now the longest standing member of that group and uh, they collectively have um, caught and apprehended over a thousand poachers locally. Um, they do some really exciting work. And um, he's in this particular row because um, part of his work is to really champion anti-corruption, rejection of bribes, trying to get community members to recognize that uh, wildlife actually represents um, you know, a fantastic source of um of income and a regular source of income which he uh explains to people really transformed his life so that that personal story of transition towards the um desired behavior has been critical in in him achieving success um of course alongside all of this are really important to recognize how um society should be enabled to report corruption where it happens which is the final box on the bottom left um, and uh, important to know that if they do report corrupt acts, that they will be taken seriously and protected from harm. Um, and there are a number of initiatives being driven forward. This is a South Africa relevant case study um, to try to, to address that issue. Um, still some way to go, as we know, but it, it kind of illustrates um, the issues that uh, Claudia was mentioning in her slides. So trafficking um, and thinking about the policy links um, in the framework, trafficking actually was the one stage where minimal um, potential for social norms and behaviour change was identified. Um, but one of the um, case studies we also identified from the wildlife trade offender research was um, some of the offenders saying that um, they, they had experienced corruption in the judicial process. They were alleging that um, to have occurred with others. So the example was given that um, you can pay a bribe to escape criminal conviction, jail time or financial penalties. And obviously they had not been able to do that because they were in jail, um, but they had heard that that was possible. Um, and uh, and this is another way in which corruption um, kind of really undermines other actions to combat illegal wildlife trade. Um, if it's not taken seriously or if you can pay your way out of trouble, um, you know, it really uh, creates huge problems and undermines other action. Um, so this insight from the incarcerated report um, kind of digs into that a little bit more deeply. Um, looking here in particular at um, abalone um, and the role of drivers that, uh, and traffickers and how they're involved, thinking about how you can really kind of ensure the convictions are, are carried through, and custodial sentences do arrive. And what's the role of social norms and behaviour change amongst that work? Um, some, some really exciting initiatives being driven around the world in this field, actually. Um, so thinking about, um, you know, very obviously it would be necessary to make sure prosecutors are charged with taking bribes where that does occur. Um, the example that's uh, up there is uh, in Georgia, in Tbilisi in Georgia. Um, so not relevant to the region, but, um, you know, lots of opportunity to make sure that um, where that does occur, um, prosecutions do happen. It's actually really an important part of social norm and behaviour change work to show that there are consequences for engaging in the bad behaviour. Um, and this is common sense uh, to many of us, I'm sure. Thinking a little bit more about evolving from um, punitive measures through to um, carrots. Um, the persuasive tactics uh, really getting some momentum now are building on what's called the Bangalore principles of judicial con conduct. Um, perhaps some of those of you on the call will already be aware of these. Um, they were first postulated in 2006. They've been upgraded in 2018 and they're trying to encourage um, judiciary to actually state and develop things like codes of conduct, codes of ethics, um, really, really interesting webinar that I've put the link to there. We don't really have time to talk about it in depth today. But if you're interested to do this um, and are uh, interested to get some tips about how and some real world experience, um, uh, Senior Justice for the Caribbean, um, Adrian Saunders talks about his experience of, of trying to introduce this there. Um, and it's a 15 minute um, overview that I found really interesting when I listened to it. So I would, I would recommend that. Thinking about um, some good examples of how you reduce the um, kind of society's expectation to do things like pay bribes and to 
um, increased transparency in relation to the judicial um, practice in particular. Um, this has been found to be really uh, um, important in strengthening preventative measures, trying to um, ensure there's independence in the judicial process and that there's segregation between some of the steps uh, involved in, in taking cases through to um, court and to successful conclusion in court. Um, obviously, court case tracking is, is another way in which increased transparency and traceability um, can be applied very rigorously to, um, uh, to ensure there's public accountability um, to prevent uh, bribery and other forms of corruption occurring. Similarly, um, really interesting initiative that I, I really like is the Zero Repeal Note um, introduced by Fifth Pillar, which is an NGO in, in India. And um, it basically enables those that are asked to pay a bribe to um, hand over this note, which says, I promise to neither accept nor give a bribe. And um, uh, it's achieved quite a lot of um, positive progress in India and in um, enabling people to um, show their rejection, societal rejection of, of, of paying bribes. Uh, all the links are provided for those that like more information. Um, finally, moving quickly through to uh, conclusion, thinking about corruption in end markets, uh, this was the only area actually in the in the framework where it seemed to suggest the potential for social norm and behaviour change interventions um, in their own right could be quite high. Um, that's based, of course, on lots of work at the moment to apply these approaches to um, demand reduction initiatives. And I know there's some on the call that have lots of experience of this. Um, whether it's uh, also got strong potential for corruption involved in that um, remains to be seen. Um, we've kind of based our assessment of how the strong potential evidence for reducing things like corporate gifting of high value products. Um, two examples here to move again a bit away from the um, usual suspects of, of pachyderms, pangolins and big cats. This is relevant to a lot more species than those um, uh, which are typically featured in the media headlines. So the example of, of ginseng here and also cordyceps, which is the fungus that grows inside the caterpillar. Um, these are, are really high value commodities um, from uh, non-timber forest products. And often they're um, sort of considered to be used as bribes, uh, lavish gifts for um, themselves. We've, we've published a paper on this that's available on the TNR WC website. Uh, the link is available there if you'd like to understand a little bit more about how these are used. Um, thinking about, again, the role of social norm and behaviour change solutions here, it's it's much more clear um, that uh, there could be approaches. So um, the distinction between self and society, I, I've kind of removed here because it's uh, they, they kind of blend into one a little bit. Um, but to take Vietnam as a, a really interesting case study at the moment, um, China and Vietnam have had uh, very significant anti-graft campaigns led by, by their governments. China's uh, started uh, some years back now, but Vietnam started in around 2016. And it's been in the news earlier this year because it's moved out of crackdowns on, on uh, public officials into now the private sector. And, and this has led to a real disruption in the um, in the markets in Vietnam, where two very senior and very large real estate um, kind of firms, their, their CEOs were um, convicted of, of um, fraud and, and other types of corrupt acts. Um, this offers a lot of opportunity, I think, to send a clear message to Vietnamese society that um, uh, the government is, in particular, the Ministry of Public Security is really trying to get on top of um, the levels of corruption that uh, in the past have seemed endemic in um, Vietnamese um, uh, different sectors. And um, Blazing Furnace, uh, there are lots of good hooks that are available to shift from that uh, penalties, prosecution across to a bit more of the persuasion. Uh, in 2018, there was an anti-corruption law brought in, which requires all companies in Vietnam to develop codes of conduct and additional measures that um, uh, show company leadership against corruption and uh, to reduce the expectation of this being a, um, a societal or, or even corporate norm in, in you know, everyday practice in business in Vietnam. Um, and uh, for example, the Vietnamese Chamber of Commerce and Industry um, is really strong. We've done quite a lot of work with them in the past. Um, they uh, do relate to the International Chamber of Commerce 
And there are some good kind of guidance on, on that website about how you can, as a company, um, kind of take a bit more of a proactive stance with your staff and with your suppliers um, around things like codes of integrity, getting individual staff members to commit to that, making it a, an explicit part of engagement. Um, with society, there's been um, some strong trends evidence. I've run out of time probably already, um, but a great report that's uh, linked there, produced by Indochina Research, um, they've conducted these uh, routine assessments of Vietnamese society. Um, in the most recent study, a significant jump up from previous studies, 71% um, of those surveyed said that they felt they had a role to play in combating corruption and that they were willing to do things like re refuse to pay bribes or to report corrupt acts where they occur. But unfortunately, um, only one in two um, said that they had no fear of personal consequences, which creates real challenges for, um, you know, how you move forward with um, re-establishing some social norms around this. Um, it's a very rapid run through. Uh, these are intended to give an illustration of how you might proceed. I do hope we get uh, more time for discussion. Some consistent ingredients for success with social normal behaviour change approaches. Uh, thinking about the enabling environment and just making sure you've got great insight and understanding into all of the factors that influence both the uh, what we would call the bad behaviour and the de desirable behaviour. Making sure that you're clear about who you're targeting, don't just issue um, kind of blanket communications and expect those to educate and inform the public and that to achieve change. Uh, use persuasive tactics and messaging where possible. Um, ground it in a clear uh, framework and theory, make sure you consider who your messengers are and uh, the types of message frame that you use, try to adopt a positive um, frame rather than just instill a sense of doom in people, it's quite disabling, um, and make sure you adapt your message over time. Um, there's more on these topics on uh, our website course um, available for those that are interested. And this is all intended to complement uh, the problem analysis that we're here to share with you today. So um, thank you very much and handing back to um, Saba. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gail. Thank you very much also, Claudia, for sharing more about your research, the various approaches anchors to adopt, but also the very practical examples that you've given us of how to put this framework into action. Uh, let me invite, uh, invite our audience members to please uh, share with us your questions or comments, having heard Gail and Claudia speak about their research, uh, point of uh, feedback you have for them. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me let us move over and continue hearing from our two discussants uh, to reflect on the practical implications of some of the research findings. Uh, Fabri, Director of Policy at Traffic, uh, let us please start with you. And um, could you share some more light about some what could be uh, examples of how these findings can be practically applied that you see uh, from your position and work? What are some of the priorities to tackle IWT related corruption through the use of social norms and behavior change approaches? And what barriers do you see and how could we overcome them? Thank you. Thanks, Abba. I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear that uh, corruption is you know, one of the most significant facilitators of legal and unsustainable wallet trade. Um, but corruption can take many different forms, uh, ranging from, for example, the use, the issuing of fraudulent hunting permits or, uh, uh, or well, uh, issuing of uh, fraudulent uh, export permits to corporate gifting at the demand reduction side. Uh, or illicit financial flows. So you know, there, there, and and you know, each of these different forms of corruption uh, has is is driven by by quite different behaviors. Uh, it's done by quite different actors. So there's there's no there's no you know, one size fits all approach to addressing corruption within illegal or trade. So that I think the findings of this report uh, gives us the opportunity. To see how we can we can look at these different forms of corruption, what approaches we need to take, who are the different actors we need uh, to address, and I think that would make these anti-corruption efforts uh, all that more all that more effective. And you know, ad addressing corruption within the illegal or left trade sphere has so far focused on uh, 
you know, awareness of legislative or regulatory uh, or administrative actions. It really hasn't looked at uh, how to tackle the behaviors that lead to this corruption. So hopefully these findings will help in the development of training programs that can take into account you know, social behavior approaches uh, that, that are effective. I think we, we really need to take advantage of the fact that there are some really significant policy initiatives that, uh, that, are, that are making it ideal for us to address corruption within the uh, illegal wildlife trade sphere right now. So within the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, within CITES, the convention that addresses of international wildlife crime. There are two developments now uh, that, are, that are absolutely relevant. Right now, for example, we have for the first time ever a resolution within CITES that specifically addresses uh, anti-corruption uh, and uh, encouraging sort of commitments from government to implement anti-corruption actions to address illegal wildlife crime. Uh, so you know, corruption is no longer a taboo word within uh, the, the wildlife crime uh, era. The other development is that there's also greater recognition within CITES uh, to using social behavior change uh, approaches as an agent of change, going beyond you know, awareness uh, and, and posters and billboards and using exactly the kind of uh, structured social behavior approaches that uh, Claudia and Gail talked about in, in the findings. So the, the, the enabling environment is just right for us to implement these, these, different, uh, these different approaches that uh, we talked about in the past half hour. Now, I think Claudia mentioned evidence based in her presentation. And I think a key priority for us is to get that evidence base to identify, for example, who are the different target audiences that we need to talk to which are these actors where we can have the most impact? Uh, is it the frontline staff uh, at the point of uh, entry uh, to, to a country? Is it uh, the decision maker who, who issues the CITES permits? Uh, is, it the, uh, is, it, is it the audience in the private sector, whether in, uh, uh, for example, in the transport sector that facilitates uh, some disruption? And then once you've identified those different uh, actors, what are the motivations, the attitudes, and the behaviors that we want to address? Uh, and what are the what is the messaging that we want to deliver to these people uh, in order to make them change their behaviors? And we really need to take into we really need to look at all the different actors, not just how to change the behaviors of the per perpetrators, but also how do we encourage uh, whistleblowers and others within the organization uh, to, uh, to be able to be more aware of corrupt practices and report these uh, practices uh, to people. Behaviors, uh, as, as, as both our presenters said, it's not just a matter of uh, uh, making ends meet sometimes. Sometimes is it, is it, is it part of the organizational uh, culture uh, that these practices uh, are so prevalent, and in which case, what, what's, what's the messaging that we need to deliver? Uh, who are the people that we need to deliver these messages? It may not necessarily be the people at the top. It could be uh, other, other, other champions of anti-corruption that we want to use in order to influence uh, more uh, zero-tolerant behavior towards corruption. And I think one, one other thing we need to think, take into account is evaluation. I don't think any of our speakers mentioned evaluation, but it's absolutely essential that as we develop these uh, approaches, as we identify the target audiences and the messages, uh, how do we evaluate these approaches so that we know we're going in the right direction and we're doing the right thing? And how do we adapt uh, to ensure that, uh, to ensure that uh, uh, we're, we're, we're taking the right approach or whether we should change that approach towards a different actor or towards a different uh, towards different behaviors. Finally, I think one in terms of barriers, 
I'm, I'm, I'm a wildlife trade specialist. I'm not a social behavior change expert. Uh, and you know, to do this kind of work, you do need social behavior change experts. Uh, and one thing we found in trying, for example, in, for example, trying to encourage behavioral change uh, approaches in, in demand reduction is that there's this general feeling that uh, this, this is a, social behavior change is an area of work that is well beyond uh, expertise of those, uh, most people involved uh, in, in managing uh, natural resources. So we have to make sure that we bring in the right experts uh, in, in the field, uh, and that there is there's co a commitment to investing in, in uh, uh, social uh, behavior change experts who can do the job properly with the advice and in consultation uh, with uh, some of the natural resource managers. Thank you very much, Fabri. So very, very interesting to hear your reflections. Um, let me give the floor to Robert. Robert, coming from the perspective uh, of an anti-corruption expert, um, can you can you give us some uh, your your ideas, your insights on what would be the relevance and the, and the, and the usefulness of the report findings for you, and what are some of the programming implications you see? Thank you, Sabah, and thank you for all the listeners and uh, the the, pre the previous presenters. I think. Uh, this framework is is one is 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 is, is a good one. It's, uh, it's informative, but also it gives good insight. Uh, for example, social norms and and, uh, and corruption. I think that's a very interesting topic as to really uh, respect to understand how things happen and why things happen. And uh, I mean, understanding the the really the, the 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 causes, the root causes of whatever we see. For example, in this framework um, and the social norms, how the rest are expected to, the corrective action, how the rest are expected to behave when faced with the same, same challenges. I think that's one of very critical because uh, if I, I expect that the, uh, my neighbor, my friend and my brother would be, will pick the money, will pick a bribe on this, then chances are probably 90% that I will do the same because uh, probably there are also other circumstances or reasons why that has come to a level where everyone is expected to do it. So I think that one is very critical and uh, that normative norm is, is, is critical in addressing corruption for both the researchers, but also for, for, for us who are the for, uh, forefront of fighting corruption. Then the other issue which actually comes out of this, especially when you have this corrective action is, is lack of sanctioning by the society. I know that many of the anti-corruption initiatives, whether in wildlife or the rest of our other fields, they are concentrating on the legal function, uh, sanction. But I think it is very important also to look at the social sanction. That's the most critical. If I pick the money from the government, if I allowed what I mean illegal wildlife products to be tracked through my through my boundaries, what will the society say? If the society is not going to bother. If the society is not going to actually is going to be on my my on, on my side like it is in the many of our countries, in my best in Uganda, where it's one of the the known destinations uh, for trafficking, then it means that uh, you, someone may not think twice because you know that it will not be societal sanction. The society is very critical in defining what is good, what is acceptable, and what is not, and it's very very difficult to fight something which is acceptable widely accepted because to mean that those who are fighting are going to be, I mean, overwhelmed and are not going to be fully supported. I think that is critical, which this uh, framework brings on board. So are this, is the society ready to sanction those whom we think are doing the wrong thing? And if not, why would that, what will be done? Then the, there is also an issue which really comes out, which is very critical into this, especially in wildlife, the perce perception of the community, citizen relationship with wildlife, because that one also informs that, uh, the, I mean, inform their opinion, their perception, you know, their connectivity to, 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 to wildlife and how far and what extent can they get to support the, 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 uh, the fight against corruption. I mean, against corruption or the fight against illegal uh, 
uh, wildlife trade, uh, trafficking or trade generally. Now, I, I'm currently work with the with the with the initiative titled Strengthening Systems and Public Accountability, Public Accountability. It's a USAID funded initiative to address corruption, but also to promote accountability in the private sector. Now, when you look at what we want to do on TEF, at on Teva, you find that uh, we are planning to, 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 oh, we are already doing some work around this, basing on, on, this, uh, on, this, uh, on this framework, supporting initiative that promotes social change. Now, there are two fundamental questions, maybe which need to be further uh, scrutinized and uh, maybe interrogated. Because in the corrective, uh, in the corrective, uh, in the in, in the corrective action, it is assumed that there is some level of acceptability of corruption. But there is also a fundamental question: Is there a society that, from its beginning, has, has been accepting corruption? If that's not the case, maybe at one time all societies were resenting corruption. How come that society has come to be accepting? Because that one is critical as we are using this framework to understand the root cause of that change you see. Because maybe trying to address it without understanding, why would a society, is it a coping mechanism? Are people coping after this, a failure, a dysfunctionality? For example, in, in, in enforcement, that has made people to, 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 to just lose hope and lose, lose focus. So that at the end of the day, they have seen that nothing much can be done, so they are coping. So if that is the case, then the root cause will be, I mean, can you address this, the, the, the other side response, responsiveness of the government, responsiveness of the institutions, so that you don't create a situation where, I mean, the rest of the, the, the people or the society have believed that corruption is the way to go, and that's the only way of achieving whatever you want to achieve. So I think that one has to be kept at the at, at our at the back of our mind that societies may be there's nothing none, none of the societies more prone than the other, but circumstances are forcing them so that this analysis we go into that circumstance and try to address what really caused this, this, that general generalized way of accepting that things are supposed to be done in the wrong way. So what are, and what can we do done to reverse that trend? Is, is very important. And that's why we try to, to see, like in this program, we are trying to try to, to, to keep understanding the social name, the behavior, that's behavior drivers we're talking about. What causes those behavior? Through engaging, why would people, the public sector, the, the civil society, the, the general public, why would they behave that way? How, what can be done in order to, to, to change that attitude? We intend to have like integrity icons to be to be like to to try it also to to profile uh, those who have been involved or those who have decided to do the contrary to what many people may think to be the I mean the way to go or the way of life. How do we promote those ones? Because the media is full of uh, and people who are negative who are actually famous for being negative. They are they have they have been corrupt. They have been voted into high positions. They actually be living huge and large and big. Then they, they become a good example. In other words, we are we actually creating heroes. So on the other side, can we also create some heroes of those who may not have a lot of money, but because, I mean, they, but they have integrity. So we have um, integrity icons, positive deviants, trying to identify them and being able to recognize them so that we can counter this negativity that has come and has become a part, part of the, I mean, the way to go. Sensitization of the public, but also uh, building capacity in terms of how do we, how do you, how do actors try to, um, I mean, understand, use, use of like, like this framework, understand how social norms and can contribute to whatever vice we are talking about, the corruption in one life, how can it be actually used to turn things around? So we, are, we want to support those issues, but we're also intending to support accountability initiatives. You know, the sharing of resources that is generated from wildlife, from tourism, 
but even the communities don't get to know about them. No, they, no, they, they keep the negative attitude towards uh, wildlife. Yet they actually are supposed to be they can they are supposed to be benefiting, but because they don't see that money, then they keep that negativity, and that can help them to support actually the vice instead of fighting it. So we want to see and try to work with the civil society and other communities, conservationists, to ensure that we 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 also try to to, to, to ensure value for money from these resources. So by and large, this is a very good initiative. This is a very good framework. Further analysis is supposed to be done to understand these behavior changes we are seeing in our society and address those root causes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, in the questions and answers section, uh, we have been seeing very good questions come in, very pointed questions, and Gil and Claudia have provided answers to that, uh, which everyone can uh, read and see. And unfortunately, although uh, uh, this is a very interesting um, topic, and obviously I'd like to discuss it further with everyone here in the room, our time has ended. So I'd like to thank everyone, our panelists, for their presentation, our discussion, for their very uh, pointed reflections. I want to thank our audience members for their engagement and their very good feedback questions. Uh, we hope this has inspired you to dig deeper into the research findings, and we very much look forward to staying in touch. And thank you very much again for joining us today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.